All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine, Pipeliner CRM. And today I am joined by Carrie Anderson, who is up in the Bay Area in lovely Sausalito, San Francisco. How are you doing, Carrie? Very well, thank you. I'm excited to talk with you. Excellent, excellent. You're not you're not sitting by the dock of the bay today, which is up in Sausalito, which is where uh, that <laughs> song was written, actually. It go. is, and I'm yeah. looking out of the water, and it's wonderfully grounding. <laughs> excellent. So Carrie is an Emmy-winning uh, former NBC and Wall Street Journal uh, reporter. Her TED Talk has uh, on the web of humanity has attracted over 2.2 million views. And now she um, advises and, and helps uh, people with this whole concept of moving from me to we. So the idea of mutuality. Um, so, so Carrie, when you talk about mutuality, what do you mean by that? I mean, to look at people as opportunities to find sweet spots of shared interest in more situations, because the world's going to get increasingly complex and tech, and we can't all be experts at everything. So if you have diverse allies, you can see more sides to a situation. So there's a real benefit in finding sweet spots and helping each other. But that is something that doesn't, uh, in some ways, it doesn't seem to come naturally to people, is it, to build um, to build allies like that, especially in the workplace where we feel like uh, often that we should know everything, even though we know that we couldn't possibly. I think that's true. And I think it's important in a company culture to um, encourage people to seek each other out and use their best talents with each other and be candid about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and but and I think that 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 concept of 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 candor is. I mean, you have to build a culture that that promotes candor, but in the right in the right way. Okay, and where people feel comfortable and trusting that they can be open and honest. Yeah, I think so because I've now consulted with so many people and companies, and I think the key thing is saying, I do seek a sweet spot of mutual interest, and so may we explore it. I've heard of it, this about you. Is that one of it, the, your key talents or missions? Mm -hmm. And so we can dive in. And I realize asking follow-up questions is key to show an interest and confirm and say, and let's agree to disagree where we can too, to say, oh, that's important to me, but this is even more important. Yeah. And I think that concept of common interest, right? Because I think that's the other part is when sometimes when, you know, people look to collaborate in an organization, they will go so far and then the kind of competitive thing kicks in and it's almost like, well, if you and I are working together and collaborating on something, is that making you look better than me or me look better than you? You know, that kind of thing kicks in. How do you overcome that where people see an, an abundance, a, a greater outcome rather than, you know, get into the whole competitive element? I think it's how a company characterizes its values, number one, and get specific about it. And number two, I think if you realize that someone offered you help in a way you didn't know you needed in it and you didn't know they could provide it, it's a start. Mm -hmm. Like I believe healthy relationships are not based on a quid pro quo, but an ebb and flow of mutual support over time. Mm -hmm. And ironically, when you bring that up, one of the key things that's hardest for us to do when we're experts is to get specific sooner. When I get specific about what I need or what I think I can help you on, I've gained greater self-clarity to do it. I reduce the chance of misunderstanding and I become more credible and memorable to you. Mm -hmm. I really like that concept of the ebb and flow because I think that's because we live in this in this age, I think, where everybody expects something in return immediately and they expect it to if I if I need something, I get it right now and, it, and it's delivered. But this idea of you, know, you and I may collaborate on something and maybe 70% of the benefit flows in your direction at the beginning. Uh, um, but later on, it comes back to me. But that requires you to understand the concept of ebb and flow, yeah? I think that's true. But the large thing that I see happening, and frankly, ever since my TED Talk, even more, which is now 2.3. 2.3, right? excellent. But it's so many people reach out because they want something. And that short term is pushing people back. And I think when one of the ways you reach out and show your attitude is to say, I notice this is what you're doing. I have a suggestion of two possible assets or technologies that may not be right, but do you want to 
uh, explore it. So I think offering something up front is important. But secondly, it does go to fear. I really believe the law of unintended consequences is becoming the norm, not the exception. And every technology from drones to whatever is going to have an up and down side. So if I can pitch and say, because things change so fast and I can't be an expert at everything, um, let's find where there's ways we can be helpful and see how specific we get. So again, I go back to specificity. Mm-hmm. And and I think that's an inter- that's a that's an interesting uh, point as well because um, for specificity, you also have to kind of know what you what you need, right? And I think that's sometimes people approach a situation without really taking the time out to think about well, what do I actually need? Oh, I strongly agree with you there. I do. And I think the best way to change people's behavior is to see the power of something being specific. Mm -hmm. Ironic for me is that I have a a brain hole. Literally, I learned in college, I have no sense of direction. Mm -hmm. So when I reached out to help people, they said, oh, that you're kidding. And I say no. And when they help me, somehow it makes them feel heroic and they help other things. The second thing I'll say briefly When I worked for the Wall Street Journal, I I was the first woman in in London, Mm -hmm. and I instinctively went to the the man who was a chief financial officer, and I I said, I listened to you in a meeting. I'll make an offer, and you can just shut me out and push me out the door, and he cracked up laughing. I said, but I can make you more pithy and specific, so when you're in the board meetings, I'd like you to startle the marketing people because you're actually more credible and interesting than them. Right. And he cracked up laughing. He says, okay, I don't have time now, but I do later. <laughs> then two days later, he called me and says, I-, I need you. I said, we've got 10 minutes. We became allies because our talents were so vastly different, we'd often crack up laughing. And he stays a friend that was a decade ago to this day. Right. So I'm just saying, sprinkled in there are specifics. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, and I, and I, I like what you're saying there because, I mean, you, you <laughs> offered him something very specific, something that could help him. And then through that, obviously, it became very helpful to you as well because, I mean, having if you're working for the Wall Street Journal, um, which has got a big financial element, and having uh, the, the CFO or whatever as an ally is probably a good thing when it comes to your writing, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, and unexpected allies. I believe yeah. in the rule of three, the trinity. Um, I actually knocked a guy over when I got out of an elevator one day because I was late to go to my speech and he fell on the floor and he says, do you always introduce yourself that way? (laughs) And I packed up laughing because he could have been mean and pissed, Mm -hmm. but he trained himself. And and he said, what are you doing? I said, what I'm doing. He said, give me two tips on quotability. I said, I will. Will you walk with me? He says, you don't know who I am, do you? (laughs) I said, should I? And he he is a a professional star. basketball player and we are unexpected allies so i say find the rule of three you take one common stand and you're going to have interestingness you'll get visibility and it also makes life more of an adventure Mm -hmm. sorry to be so wordy but no no that was great and did you get called for a personal foul on that one or not (laughs) (laughs) well actually i just got goosebumps because i did that later on i guess i really like dry humor i Mm -hmm. think one of the best ways to connect because I'm not naturally funny, but when I'm around people are, and it just cracks me up laughing, uh, they say, oh, you're easy to make laugh. <laughs> but I think our world needs it. Like you haven't, you've been doing it naturally and on the mm-hmm. side, and it warms us up. And you also have, I'll say, what's called a genial face and repose. Less than 7% of Americans do anymore. Mm-hmm. It means even when you're not on, because I looked at some of your other videos, you look comfortable and grounded and interested in someone. And I think that's really powerful when we want to connect with people. Some people naturally look itchy and irritated, but it's just because they're tired. Mm-hmm. And 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 I think that's a really um, and thank you for the compliment. But um, I think that's a that's a really put that aside for a moment. But I think it's a really interesting uh, concept because I do think we have become we're we're living in a world right now where it seems like everybody's angry, right? People are angry nonstop, and they're finding things to be angry about nonstop, and and 
I think people have forgotten to look at how you come across to other people, right? So your point there is uh, it's it's going to be really hard for you to develop those kind of allies or relationships with people if you don't come across like you're somebody who they would even want to be friendly with, right? And I, and I think it would be good if we got a little bit more consciousness about how we project ourselves, don't you think? I absolutely agree with all those points. And, and I think, again, it's seeing people and being impressed. So, for example, if you open your eyes slightly wider, not mm. like you're a deer in headlights, yeah. you actually look more caring. It's just, but you actually feel it as well. And I'll just say this 30 second thing. I got to cover a guy who was a baseball, uh, was a ball player in Barcelona. And when he went mm. out in the field, people are yelling from the um, stands racial epithets. Mm -hmm. And um, it got really nasty. And then there was a break time. And he walked back on, and these people had the audacity to throw bananas at him, which right. apparently is making them look like monkeys. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he actually did slow down slightly, picked one banana, peeled it back, um, ate two bites, threw it over his shoulder, and went back on the field. And the whole shift became the people that were not doing racist. They stood up and cheered. They imitated him. And he got to be visible outside the sports world. Mm -hmm. And it was a reminder to me because I don't know anything about sports and I was asked to cover the thing. It was so moving. Yeah, so I, re I remember that. I've kinda, I can't remember the player's name now, but I remember the incident for sure. Okay. And and it was it was take removing the power from the minority and allowing the silent majority to actually become vocal, and I think that's a I think that's a great analogy because I do think that uh, even in a work context people have become very suspicious. Like people are always very suspicious of. I mean, even if you offer help, um, people are like, "Oh, that's great," and then it's like, "Why are they offering help to me?" You know, what's going on here? <laughs> And I think that whole idea of maybe, you know, being able to release some of the suspicion uh, because it's pervasive in society, this whole idea of like there's something behind everything. I think that's true, but everybody doesn't react the same way. Mm -hmm. So knowing your hot buttons, what specifically most bugs you. And I believe in revenge <laughs> and the best revenge is the world of life. Mm -hmm. And when I've seen other people act where in the face of someone insulting them, they say, well, clearly that's the concern. Do you want to explore how we can make it better for both of us? And I think role playing in a culture is so vital and it's going to be really vital through the end of next year as people run for president in our country. Mm -hmm. I want people to stand up and offer a better, brighter picture, not to just criticize someone, but to say this is something I think would be fair, healthier, whatever. So it's going to be a real chance for individuals to stand proactively for things they're for and to cite other people they deeply admire and say, specifically, I know three people who did that. Mm -hmm. And those three people get bragging rights to talk about them. So ironically, it's one of the best ways to build your clout and credibility and visibility. Yeah, and and it is such a shame that obviously in the in the political environment that negative campaigning has become the the default position for everybody. It seems, and I don't know. I mean, that obviously says something about us as a as a culture if that works. Um, so I agree with you. I would like to, uh, it'd be great if we could see some more um, um, positivity. And I think it starts. I mean, I personally believe it. It it, it starts. Uh, you have to start local, right? You have to start with yourself and your own relationships, and then it'll expand out from there. And to your point, in in a in a work context, I mean, you have to build a coalition of like minded like minded people. Not 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 yes people, but like minded people. I agree, but I think I happen to be a fan of Salesforce. I have no financial connection, but mm -hmm. I've spoken at it. Um, several people there, when I coach them, they say, we get to use our best talents together on things that are meaningful for us. Mm -hmm. And some of the specifics that the, that the founder has cited, like when he found out that women were not making as much money as men in the same roles, he said, it's going to take a couple weeks to make the change. So I'm going to take it on my personal money. So it starts right away. I think citing an example and reinforcing it, ironically, keeps top talent and keeps high performance. Mm -hmm. 
And and I think to your point though that is it has to again back to specifics. It has to be actually something that happens rather than uh, vague uh, concepts or lip service or making grand statements, right? Because we can all stand up and make grand statements, but <laughs> but the reality is that unless there's some unless it's the small actions that actually make the difference, not grand statements, right? Yeah, the actions, not just the statements, and the statements have to be congruent with it. You said that really well. I like that sequence of it, too. And I also believe inciting those people. Ironically, the best way I've had more adventures and opportunities in my life is just citing people who I deeply admire something they've done. And it's been interesting to see what flows back, as, you, as you've done in the way you live your life. It's not push, it's pull. Mm -hmm. it's people in. Yeah, because I mean, I think that's the, and I think that's that's something of it's great takeaway to people. We talked earlier about you know listening, and that is that people, you know, there's so many people out there with so many fascinating things to say and offer, and they're often the most surprising people, right? They don't have to be professional um, speakers or writers. You know, your colleagues have. Uh, they they all have. I think it was um, I think it was Jordan Peterson who who I recently who said uh, somebody asked her, him about you know the you know something about but what about the ordinary person and he said well there is no ordinary person I don't believe in that construct right because everybody's extraordinary in their own way and I think that's part of what we need to look at is what makes each individual extraordinary. You just gave me goosebumps again. I I love that I that idea of ordinary mm -hmm. and. Ironically, there's a book called Rookie Smarts, which stuck in my mind. I'm so bad about gate tech, and my, my um, computer's been hacked and so on. If I didn't have allies to do that, and the way it happened is they said, you're so incredibly inept at learning the new tech that I offer. So I'm basically going to hire you, Kari. If, you can, if we can design this machine so that you know how to use it, most anybody can. And he <laughs> says, I know that sounds insulting. I said, no, actually... I'll do it for free. Oh, no, we'll pay you. It blew my mind. But I really believe in, in Rookie Smarts, they say, if invi involve the expert who knows so much to have the curse of knowledge and involve someone who's not good or knowledgeable. Mm -hmm. And they'll come up with some of the best and worst ideas because they don't know what they don't know. And that's been a real helpful thing in my life, going back to what you said about those yeah ordinary yeah yeah, yeah no I, I i totally agree with you. that's a that's a that's a fantastic example because yeah because i mean that's one of the the hardest things is especially when you're de uh, designing software or technology is that um the people who are building it tend to be very highly technical as you as you would hope and they don't really uh, and sometimes it's hard for them to empathize with the person who isn't who's actually going to be the person using it so i really i really like <laughs> i really like that that idea um and so what what um, if you were to say to somebody okay we're we're 2019 it's a new year what is one or two things that an individual could do differently this year that would help set them up for greater mutuality in the future I believe there's a book called The Category of One. One of the most important things is to get specific about your top three probably interrelated talents. Mm -hmm. And if you can see how they are interwoven and you can characterize them, for example, I believe in opportunity makers, creating opportunity for others, mm -hmm. connected behavior, learning what's like, and quotability. And when those are interrelated, that's a mutuality mindset. So I'm the only one who brings those three together based on research. Mm -hmm. So I'm saying to you, get specific about your three inter interrelated talents. Number two, the people you think would be most helpful, like customers if you're in a company. Mm -hmm. So it's your message, it's the medium by which they hear about you, and it's the market you want to reach, M, M, M. And I think that really helps you um, get more clarity about where to look, how to be helpful. Yeah, no, I I love that, Carrie, and I think that's a great takeaway for everybody is get specific because we're fantastic. I mean, it's like you know, when you say to somebody, you know, what do you really want to do? And they say, well, I can tell you what I don't want to do. <laughs> <laughs> and you're going, yeah, but that's not what I asked you. Um, but we're terrible at specifics sometimes. And I think that's a great message for people is to is to really d do your own homework on yourself first and get specific and then and then start to build out from there. 
One last tip. Yeah. You have what's called a musical voice. So if you were recorded and you could watch the pattern of it, mm-hmm. every th- yours is a three sentence one. So people are more tending to listen sooner and longer. And more people are having voices that flatten out. So they're talking more or less at the same level. So notice how you talk. Right. You, what you do um, is great for them to listen to words and to notice the melody of the words is keeping them involved. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, thank you. Yeah, no, that's a, that's another great piece of advice again, because I do believe that uh, it's critical how we communicate, you know, going forward. I think communication has become so... It's it, it's become so wrapped up in 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 negativity that I think you have to start to break through and figure out how to how can I how can I be different in the way I communicate. Negativity and meanness. And so meanness. Not, mm-hmm. not just not me, but about us. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. Well, this has been another fascinating conversation, Carrie. I'm delighted you could join us uh, uh, today. Uh, before we go, uh, again, I'd like you to tell people a little bit more about yourself, how they can learn more about you. Um, I have a book called Mutuality Matters. It's an e-book, and it's full of over 100 actionable insights. I have another book coming out in a couple months. And there's a website called Say It Better. Um, So maybe some of the articles on the blog would be of interest. Yeah, no, and I would recommend the Mutuality Matters. I I have it, and it's it's great. As you said, it's just got these uh, very straightforward tips in it, and I think uh, it's a great place to start. Thank you so much. It's been an honor to be talking with you, truly. Yeah, you too, Carrie. Okay, my name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine, Pipeline of CRM. See you all again for another expert interview really soon. Thank you. Thank you.